Okay, it looks like we're ready to start. Um, can you all hear me? So um, I'm Tim Garrett, presider for this session. Um, and I'm very excited about this session that we put together for everybody. Um, we're gonna cover research to, to real clinical applications and where mass spectrometry is, is starting to really interact with patients and starting to make decisions about patients and, and patient care. And I think that this is a, it, I call this a new frontier in mass spectrometry. Cl mass spec's been in clinical area for a while, but we have a really a big opportunity now to connect scientists and mass spectrometrists doing research with those practicing and sort of bridge a gap to make mass spectrometry grow and blossom in this, in this new new frontier or this new ex expanding, rapidly expanding opportunity for mass spectrometry. So, um, so it, to me, it's very exciting. As a young mass spectrometrist trying to see this growth and trying to, to teach people about the opportunities that clinical mass spectrometry has, um, as well as the different opportunities for a, a career in clinical sciences as well as in mass spectrometry. So um, I take this opportunity to just to uh, let you know if you if you could turn off turn your cell phones to vibrate or silent uh, that would be fantastic. Um, and I want to uh, welcome you and also make sure you ask questions and interact and we have plenty of opportunities for those. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Richard Yost, who. Uh, um, we'll be talking about perspectives and innovations in mass spectrometry for clinical analysis. Uh, Rick, please. All right, he's gonna time me as well. Um, thank you all for being here, and, and thanks to Tim for the invitation. Um, uh, that's not the only reason that Tim's listed as a co-author here. Um, so um, um, I'm Rick Yost. Um, Tim, who's also at the University of Florida, and Alan Rockwood, who's um, University of Utah, and, and Arup Labs are co-authors as well. So um, this is an interesting topic for me. I am um, not myself a, a clinical chemist. Um, a mass spectrometrist, analytical chemist, but um, I, I believe strongly that Tim has got it right that the next frontier for mass spectrometry is in the 70s. It was um, the environment and then drug discovery and proteomics. I think the next frontier really is clinical analysis, um, clinical chemistry, and so I think this is a very important topic. And so I spent um, a fall semester on sabbatical at ARUP in the University of Utah um, hence that connection and, and some of the, the messages we will have today. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you some perspective as I see it. Um, feel free to, to argue with me if you disagree. Um, give you some idea on the current status. Um, clearly the earliest um, clinical analyses um, that were done by um, mass spectrometry were GC mass spec for drugs and metabolites, uh, largely toxicology related. Um, but an obvious um, application that was hard or maybe impossible to do by other methods. Um, so it's been a long time. That was 25 years ago. I was actually in a, in a clinical lab, a, a clinical pathology lab. Um, so we had a lot of high school that did those kinds of things. Uh, it was GC then, not GC mass spec. 25 year, years later, LCMS MS really resurrected clinical mass spectrometry for problem analyzed things that were hard to do with classic clinical analyzers amino assays and so on. Um, first example of that may well have been methylmalonic acid, one that's very difficult to do um, by um, classic methods. Um, yeah, what really um, put LCMS MS on the map, as some of you undoubtedly know, is immunosuppressant assays for, for serolimus, which nobody could come up with any other way of measuring that and is very important for somebody who's um, in an organ transplant program, after an organ transplant, to be able to monitor these immunosuppressant uh, molecules. And of course, if you can do one of them by mass spec, as those of you who are mass spectrometers appreciate, you might as well do two or three or four or five of them. Um, and so indeed, it, it became um, uh, standard to, to do a screen of for multiple ones of those by LCMS MS. And that's what really brought modern mass spectrometry into the clinical laboratory. And now that you've got one of them, you can think about what else you might do with it. Um, so we're going to talk after that some successes and some challenges. I'll just have a couple of examples of I think things that are we're thinking about um, um, 
And then finally, I'll give you some um, brief prognosis uh, for the future if I can. Um, so here's a, a wonderful quote. It says, once upon a time, this is from Michael Bennett at UPenn, um, clinical mass spectrometry was regarded as an art form. The whole process carried such an air of mystery that most sensible clinical laboratory, laboratorians, tough word, did their best to avoid issues such as extraction procedures, manual tuning, and the use of an instrument that only operated 10% of the time. And a wonderful perspective on, um, on clinical mass spectrometry that's once upon a time. Um, and there the technology lay for several decades. I'm not sure several, two or three decades, but I think it's a, a fascinating perspective on, um, on, on how we got there. Um, and of course, the world of clinical analysis is driven by quantitation of single analytes, now and then two analytes. And that's driven not necessarily by science. It's driven partially by what physicians, how physicians think about solving problems. It's partially driven by insurance reimbursement. Um, but um, so, you know, a lot of places have developed steroid panels, but it turns out that rarely does a physician order more than one steroid analysis. You may run the panel anyway, and you bill them for the one. Um, Catecholamines are a classic case. There's normally three analytes in, in that panel. You can certainly imagine doing far more, but um, rarely do physicians order that. Um, so then, given that kind of single analyte or few analyte model, then why would there be interest in chromatography and mass spectrometry, which is inherently a multi-analyte methodology? The beauty that, that LC mass spec, GC mass spec brings to bear is being able to look for, you know, 10 or 20 or 100 compounds. So it seems like a, a mismatch between that and, um, and, and the clinical world. And so the answer really is, is one of quality. Um, let's talk for a moment about what quality means. Um, this is an Alan Rockwood term, I, one of my co-authors. And then we're going to talk about something called the four S's, which a few of you may recognize as well. So let's talk about quality. So this is a, an editorial, Dave Harold, um, whose MSACL meeting is running this week in San Diego. Some of you may have been there earlier in the week. Um, and this was an editorial 10 years ago on immunoassays for testosterone in women. Better than a guess. So um, th he was reporting, they hadn't done it themselves, they were editorializing about a paper that had been published that had values for 10 commercial testosterone immunoassays. And they were an error by a factor of two on average, and in some cases by a factor of almost five. And whereas these are testosterone in women and also children, so these are low values, not testosterone in men. Um, and indeed, they went on to point out the guessing would be more accurate, cheaper, faster, without ha ever having even to draw the patient's blood. So it's kind of an interesting model to think that when the clinical results that are reported back to physicians are worse than a guess. Okay. Um, so one could argue that if you've got a 200% error on average and some of those 10 commercial tests, a 500% error, what any of those numbers mean? Um, so that's, maybe that's not quality, maybe that's, that's why the interest in mass spectrometry is a source of quality. So let's talk for a moment about mass spectrometry and, and what it can deliver and then how that compares to classic um, clinical methods, immunoassays primarily today. Um, so the four S's of trace analysis, I think, were first described by Fred McLafferty in biomedical mass spectrometry 30-some um, years ago. Um, some of you may be familiar with these if you're an uh, analytical, trace analytical kind of mass spectrometrist, but a lot of you probably haven't heard this formalization. So the first S is S for sensitivity. That's, of course, the change in instrument response for a change in analyte concentration. That's the slope of your calibration curve, if you will. Sensitivity cannot be really expressed in terms of milligrams. Sensitivity is really how much counts or milliamps or whatever I get per milligram. Um, equally important for trace analysis is selectivity, that is freedom from interferences or a term that a lot of us now use of chemical noise. Um, and so for trace analysis, if all you care about is running standards, all you care about is the first S. Sensitivity is all that matters because you can see a, a, an atomole of whatever in standards, that's sensitivity. But in practical analysis, when you're looking at blood or urine or pick your favorite clinical sample or any other kind of sample, Real mixtures, trace analysis, selectivity is every bit as important. It's important that that signal you see is really due to the analyte and not due to something else that's in the mixture instead. So those two go hand in hand. Sensitivity is far easier to measure. 
run some standards, you can calculate the sensitivity. Selectivity, a little bit harder to do when you clearly cannot determine selectivity by running standards. You must run real samples and real matrices. Third S is speed, analysis time, including everything, sample prep and so on. Uh, was Fred's third S, and obviously that's an important one in the clinical world where all analyses should be done in less than two minutes, right? Um, maybe less than one minute. Ten minutes is a long time to a, a clinical chemist. And then the fourth S is the um, almighty S there at the bottom with the vertical line through it, which is the cost of analysis. Obviously another critical parameter in terms of whether um, these things are going to get used um, for doing solving problems. So if we think about mass spectrometry versus classical clinical analysis, and when I was first in a clinical pathology lab, those tests were almost all colorimetric tests, chemical tests, but today the vast majority of routine clinical tests have been taken over by aminoassays. So let's do that comparison as our primary comparison. Sensitivity-wise, mass spec does not beat most aminoassays. Now and then you, you can do better, and now and then you can't do it quite as well. But for the most part, if you look at overall, immunoassays have higher um, sensitivity, um, slightly, sometimes significantly, than mass spec. Um, speed, mass spec is not particularly important, uh, fast with sample prep and chromatography. Um, one can argue immunoassays aren't, or sometimes not all that fast, but, but you know, not a huge advantage for speed with mass spec. Dollars, not a huge advantage for dollars with mass spec. Maybe, maybe a wash depends upon the analysis. But the one for which mass spec really is, has a big advantage over immunoassays is selectivity. Um, and that is that immunoassays are based on antibodies and, and most antibodies, maybe all antibodies, have cross-reactivity. Um, and those cause problems. And we'll talk about some other kinds of, of selectivity problems that happen with antibody-based immunoassays as well in a moment. So selectivity is really the name of the game. That's really the quality, the confidence in the results that when you report back that testosterone value to the physician, it was better than a guess, that you actually know what it was. And again, that's rarely a sensitivity issue, not a speed or a dollar sign issue. That's a selectivity issue of a confidence in the results you report back. An analytical chemist way of thinking of clinical chemistry. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few different successes and some challenges, some in more detail. Um, I'm going to give an example of small molecule analysis, vitamin D. Um, come and talk about proteins, one of the the newest um, um, assays to come out by mass spectrometry is thyroglobulin. Um, AREP was the first to do that, but everybody else either has it or will have it soon because it's an important analysis, as you'll hear. Um, we'll talk a bit about how to reduce analysis time because analysis time, that third S, the speed one, which is so important, which also affects the fourth S, the cost for analysis. Of course, in much of clinical or much of analytical chemistry, we we bill people based upon how much it costs to do an analysis. In the world of clinical chemistry, it's based upon how much Medicare or Blue Cross will reimburse you for the analysis. Um, we'll talk about two-dimensional LCLC and give you some idea of why what you would think would be a comprehensive, slow process to do two-dimensional LCLC is a very good way to reduce analysis time, to go fast, something most of us don't think about. We'll talk about that briefly. Talk about alternatives to LC or supplements to LC, things like eye mobility. Uh, um, have one slide in bacterial identification because you can hear a lot more about that uh, shortly. But it's one of the big successes, I think, today of clinical mass spectrometry. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about one of the challenges is more that I could put up here, but I'm just going to say something about education of clinical chemists and, and medical technicians. Or maybe I should say clinicians and medical technicians because I think we uh, need to educate up and down. Okay. So let's talk about small molecule successes. There's many examples I could pick. I picked vitamin D today because it's one of the most frequently ordered clinical assays. Oprah comes on and tells everybody they're vitamin D deficient, and the number of orders goes up a week later um, at all the clinical labs in the country. Um, and it's one for which um, um, you know, assay results um, aren't always that good. One of my colleagues compares the results from you know, assays for vitamin D to, D to throwing darts at a dartboard while blindfolded. Okay, so um, this, by the way, is a um, is an endocrinologist, not a mass spectrometrist. Um, so um, LCMS MS methods have overcome many of those problems. Um, he says it's not only not even blindfolded; it's better than a dartboard. Um, and so, despite that success, implementing published methods can be a challenge. And those of you who are out there who who try and develop these kinds of mass spec methods know, oftentimes it's it's not as simple as reading someone's manuscript and saying, hey, I could do that. How hard could this be, right? So um, 
So I'll just give you some some example um, um, for this one um, one example, some data. So um, this is a method developed in Tim's lab, actually at UF, using ultra high pressure liquid ultra high performance liquid chromatography MSMS method. As most of you probably know, to analyze typically monitored 25 hydroxy D2 and 25 hydroxy D3. Um, differ by having a methyl group here and a double bond there in the D2. Um, method starts with 20, 200 microliters of serum or plasma. Um, terminal standard, we all know that in mass spectrometry to quantitate things well, we use isotopic labeled terminal standards, in this case uh, D6 version of D3. Uh, D6, six deuterios of vitamin D3, I guess we're using D to mean different things there. Um, proteins are precipitated out. Um, Liquid liquid extraction with hexane. Not everybody does that, but um, certainly for someone, some small molecule analytes, it's it's more attractive than doing solid phase uh, cleanup. Um, it says at the bottom, you can see two thirds of the words. LCMS MS using three selective reaction monitoring um, stages, um, three different transitions for each analyte and for the internal standard. Um, and here are the results. Um, um, remarkably good R squared values um, over a pretty wide range, limit of quantitation about five nanograms per mil for both D2 and D3. Interday precision about 5%. Interday precision maybe 15% um, for most of the analytes. Extraction efficiency fairly good out of um, serum and plasma and fairly consistent as well. Um, and the chromatograms are, are pretty clean. Um, so that's the kind of chromatogram you would like to see when doing um, these kind of clinical analyses. Um, this is notice about four and a half minutes. This is still a little long for the average clinical chemist who wants to go faster. But, um, but you can see very little um, potential interference. It's some, some of the peaks that, that um, fall in there you have to worry about. So um, clean chromatograms, accurate method, reliable method, uh, now in, in standard use at UF, uh, replacing a, a previous immunoassay method. But it took a long time to develop, despite all the published methods that are out there. And so I think one of the concerns for the community has to be, you know, how do we come up with methods that are more transferable from lab to lab so not everybody has to do this from scratch. And I don't think we're there yet. Um, so if small molecules are a success, let's talk about big molecules, proteins and peptides. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about this from Nate shortly, so I won't say too much. But I did want to give you one example, and this is thyroglobulin. Um, so if you don't know why people care about that molecule, um, Following thyroidectomies, um, when someone has thyroid cancer, you remove the thyroid gland, um, or sometimes um, surgically, sometimes using um, radioactive iodine um, and just kill it. Um, thyroid globulin is monitored fairly routinely after that to monitor um, missed thyroid tissue that you didn't get at all, or uh, metastasis that it's, um, that it's metastasized and has moved elsewhere in the body. Um, thyroid globulin, by the way, is a big um, protein, molecular weight 660,000 is a dimer, um, not trivial to measure by mass spectrometry. Um, and um, why you want a mass spec method is that detecting thyroglobulin by immunoassay is a challenge because many patients have autoantibodies to <coughs> thy thyroglobulin. Um, why would they do that? Well, let's see, they had thyroid cancer. You know, so it would not be an, not too surprising, perhaps, that some people would have developed antibodies to thyroglobulin. And so that gives you false negatives on all the amino assays. Um, so in this assay, you developed at Europe, start with 500 microliters of serum, um, optimize every step along the way, sample prep to enhance sensitivity and selectivity, right, to get rid of interferences and maximize um, sensitivity so you can see these pretty low levels that are necessary. Um, enrich um, thyroglobulin and deplete, deplete other proteins using actually an antibody, despite the fact we say we don't like, like antibody methods. In this case, rabbit anti-TG works pretty well. Um, so complex it with, um, with that, realizing that some of the TG may already be complex with antibodies, um, from autoantibodies. Um, precipitate out those by ammonium sulfate. Um, Add an internal standard, you know, constant theme, of course, for mass spectrometry is isotopically labeled internal standards. In this case, this is the peptide we're looking for. Uh, has these wings added onto it that are isotopically labeled. Um, prior to digestion, do a protein digestion, um, and then an affinity purification of this target peptide using cis-kappa. Um, 
using this is using a peptide antibody to that on magnetic beads, separating it out in that way. So we, um, and then two-dimensional LC, LC, MS, MS. So when you think about it, that is a really complicated multi-step process. You know, we're doing a, a cleanup up here of the protein. We're doing a cleanup here of the peptide. Um, you know, none of this is simple, but that's what's necessary to get to these low levels and to be able to see um, thioglobulin successfully. Um, so here's the product spectrum, MS, MS spectrum of that particular peptide. There's the precursor ion, it's doubly charged from electrospray. Um, <coughs> you do MS, MS on that and you can see um, a nice sequence of ions and indeed uh, there you have the sequence for that, for that peptide and you see all of those. So you can detect um, as many of those as you want to pick from and um, use that for, um, for quantitation. You also have the, the internal label isotopic labeled internal standard as well. And so here you see the results on the right, the internal standard. Over here, the, um, the peptide itself, realizing that this internal standard has these wings on it, it does not coelute with the uh, um, analyte exactly. Um, and so um, this is five nanograms of um, a thioglobulin per mil, five parts per billion, and um, that's a very reasonable spot to be. And, um, and the LCMS, MS data look great. Um, so this is five minutes, if you look at the retention time there. Um, they're working on making that shorter. But this is um, a two-dimensional LC, LC analysis. Um, and um, when I first visited ARAP and, and there on sabbatical, I was floored that they did that because I always think of two-dimensional chromatography as people do that who really want to carefully characterize lots of components, all the components in complex mixtures. And in this case, that's not the purpose at all. They do two-dimensional LC. Um, in order to do fast analysis. And so most analyses they do there, they target two minutes, and what they find is you can spend two minutes on one column, but far more, far better efficiency, far better separation power if you spend one minute on the first column and then cut a, a fraction over to a second column, which is different, and spend one minute on the second column by having two different phases, um, dramatically better separation in a short time. So I encourage those of you who are thinking about fast analysis to think about something that you probably wouldn't have thought about, which is doing two-dimensional HPLC, LCLC, not because you're trying to look at everything in the mixture, even though you're only looking for one or, or two compounds. Um, that certainly was a, something that I got as a take-home message from time at AREP um, that I had not anticipated. Um, okay, so some uh, maybe some messages there in terms of people who are interested in looking at clinical um, peptide proteins. First is autoantibodies are an issue for a number of analytes. This is a good place where mass spectrometry can beat out immunoassays. And it turns out that there are even a significant portion of the population that has anti-mouse and anti-rabbit antibodies. So if you use antibodies grown up in a mouse or a rat, you can have um, these uh, antibodies from the patient react with those. And since most antibodies are grown in mice or rats, um, and those can give you positive or negative, false positive, false negative results somewhat unpredictably depending upon how you set up your assay. Um, optimized sample preparation and for sensitivity and for selectivity. Don't forget the, the selectivity part. Um, isotopically labeled internal standards um, are the ideal model if you possibly can um, because um, that obviously gives us the best quantitative precision. Um, the point that two-dimensional LCLC can speed up analyses for targeted analytes and that's I think a important message, I, was, um, I would say that well over half of the assays done by mass spectrometry at ARP use two-dimensional LCLC. First time you do it, it may be, seem a little challenging to set up, but once you got it down, um, pretty straightforward, doesn't increase the cost or complexity much over a single LC column. Um, so obviously that's one way to speed up analyses. Um, how about other ways? And so um, let's talk for a moment about um, a technique called FAMES, and this is just starting to show up in the clinical world. Um, and if you don't know what um, FAMES is, I'll tell you more about it in a moment, just a, just a bit. So I'm going to show as an example steroid analyses. <coughs> and steroid analyses are uh, an area for, that for which LCMSMS is very attractive because of all the cross-reactivity problems with immunoassays that, that most immunoassays have cross-reactivity, not for react just not to your analyte steroid, but to others as well because of the structural similarity of so many of the steroids. Um, so most of these analyses for steroids by LCMSMS are still have pretty long retention times in order to get adequate separation um, between these. 
That's a major problem for any routine analysis. So what about using FAMES? So FAMES, if you're not familiar with it, I'm not going to say much about it today, is high field ion mobility spectrometry. Um, this is doing um, ion mobility um, on, a, on a small scale between a couple of um, parallel electrodes at very high fields compared to classic ion mobility. Um, and um, commercially available from a variety of vendors today. Um, and so let's talk about doing that in this case. So this is um, specifically one going to use FAMES. This is SIAX's Select Science system. Uh, no endorsement there. It'd have to be the one that was on the instrument that I used on sabbatical um, to improve selectivity for five steroids. So this is kind of the steroid cascade. These in boxes are the five that we're going to do here. Two of those are isomers, although they're separated by HPLC. So the real problem here is not separating isomers that we couldn't tell apart by LC, but to try and clean up the background uh, some. Um, so this is another liquid-liquid extraction um, method using electrospray, about a 10-minute LC run, which is about a third of what it was before we added um, FAMES to it. I'm still pushing them to get down to two minutes. We're not there yet. Um, being five analytes, the two-dimensional LC, you know, real quick thing doesn't work as well. Um, um, this is what we then call selected mobility monitoring as well as selected reaction monitoring. So monitoring um, for each analyte, um, one pair and I going to two different daughter ions, but also picking one mobility, one FAMES value for each one in order to clean things up. And so this is time such that when you get to a particular ion coming off the column, um, a compound coming off the column, you pick the mobility and the parent mass, look at two dollars. Um, so here's the results, just a quick results. This is 0.7 part per billion progesterone in serum doing LCMSMS. This is without the FAMES system. Um, and maybe you can quantify that peak if you're uh, more um, optimistic than I, but it's pretty heavy traffic in, in that retention time for the, this MSMS channel. This is not just mass spec, this is tandem mass spectrometry. Um, turn the FAMES on and you get rid of almost all of that dramatically reduce the interferences. Now you have no problem quantifying that at, um, at 700 parts per trillion. So something I would encourage you all to think about to do LCMS assays is maybe there's a way to do some other cleanup uh, separation besides liquid chromatography. So maybe instead of being, this is not an LCLC method, this is an LC FAMES method to, for two dimensions of separation, if you will, before the MSMS. Bacterial identification by Maldi, I first was going to talk a bit about this because I think it's one of the big success stories in the clinical world for mass spectrometry today. And then I looked at the program and said, oh, <laughs> um, I won't talk much about it. But if you look at the, at the that data from 2009, 2010, this is the number of papers published on this. This is some data from Mayo, um, as well as the number of different analytes and who's publishing the papers. Pretty dramatic growth um, a couple years ago, and that continues. Um, so I'll quote from Russell Grant at LabCorp. He said, bacterial identification may ultimately dwarf all other clinical mass spec applications. What a lead-in, right? <laughs> so Preeti is going to talk about that uh, a little later in about whatever that it comes out to be an hour and a half from now in this symposium. So one of the real success stories um, of using Baldi Toff um, to do that. Um, Challenges. I'm only going to mention one. I think we could spend all day talking about the challenges in, in clinical mass spectrometry. But education, I think, is one of the most important ones. So this is from Don Chase at Pediatrics. He said, many clinical chemists are intimidated by a mass spectrometer because it is not a tool that most are trained on or historically have even had an opportunity to use. So I think that is quite a challenge. Um, for the mass spectrometers, it's easy. We know those things. Getting these in the clinical lab has been more challenging than most of us thought it would be. Um, Part of that is opportunity for education at all levels. Um, folks with AA degrees, medical technicians, uh, folks with bachelor's degrees, medical technologists, um, people with PhD degrees. I would find there's only two PhD programs in the country for clinical chemists. Um, that probably should change. Uh, Cleveland State and Old Dominion. Um, and fellowships are the classic way that people with PhDs end up into, in, from other disciplines, end up in the clinical chemistry lab as medical directors. They go to a postdoc, a fellowship in one of these um, clinical labs, and there's quite a few places that offer those. I think added to this one, but I ran out of room at the bottom of the slide here, would be educating physicians and, and other folks who, you know, or even harder probably than educating those folks um, to understand how ma what mass spec can do for them. Um, so a little bit on the future, some prognosis for us. Um, 
Imaging mass spec, I'll say something briefly about that, but again, we've got a talk coming on that one in a moment. Um, direct mass spec analysis, uh, no separation. Let's think about that one. Um, point of care mass spectrometry. Um, I think these are all important areas that are coming. And then ultimately the automated mass spec clinical analyzer, which every mass spec company in the country is trying to figure out how to build one of those, right? Um, so imaging mass spec, so I actually picked one of Liam's own examples. Hopefully you won't show that one as your first slide. Uh, Liam's talking um, 245 today about imaging mass spec based molecular histology. Um, I think this is, um, is going to have a big impact on anatomical pathology. I think the biggest challenge is that those folks think that this should be done fast and, and being able to deliver this fast enough so that they actually think it rewards them is probably the question. Um, I found that the folks who process the images and so on are very fascinated by it. I've had more trouble getting missing the pathologists themselves that this, how this fits. So I'll be interested to hear what you have to say. But I think it's clearly one of the futures that hopefully we'll make some progress in. Um, ultimate direct analysis, you know, is the surgical eye knife. Some of you may have, have heard about this already. If not, Sultan Takats is talking about it tomorrow morning in number 1510-1. Um, and so this is actually doing tandem aspect during surgery. This is not maybe kind of our classic clinical example, but otherwise the tissues would go over to the anatomical pathologist who would read them and decide if you got all the margins of the tumor or whatever. So here's a paper by him if you want to um, read more. But this is using um, this eye knife, which is basically just an electrocauterizing surgical knife, which makes smoke. And Zoltan realized that maybe the smoke would contain interesting molecules. And so somebody put a tube here, sucked that up. That tube can be pretty darn long. Um, and air is sucked through that, pushed into the heated capillary of a, of a mass spectrometer, and then analyzed by mass spec. One could argue there's no ion source here. That'd be a separate conversation. Um, uh, maybe um, he calls it rapid evaporative ionization mass spec. Um, some of these are probably ions leaving here. I'm not convinced necessarily that all the ions that we see there are ions that were made there. But in any case, um, this makes it possible to think about things like this. And they're now doing this at Imperial College in London, uh, doing surgery and um, monitoring those species by that chunk of Teflon tubing over there in a mass spectrometer. And then um, doing pattern recognition on normal tissue versus tumor, for instance. And is the surgeon's moving the knife along. When he's in um, tumor, he gets a nice red block up on the screen he can see. When he gets a normal tissue, it goes green. So I'm um, interested to think about that as kind of the ultimate example of direct analysis, no chromatography, a very fast response time. Um, point of care mass spectrometry, we now have little mass spectrometers like this. That's a cell phone for comparison. Um, Zheng Wang talked about this yesterday, so sorry I couldn't give you a lead in on that one, but there's a paper, a recent paper by um, him and others pointing out about this. And one of the things they're pushing for is dried blood spot analysis, although we can argue whether it's really dried blood spots because they don't have time to dry them. Prick a finger, put it on a, on a little triangle of filter paper, put it in front of a mass spectrometer, put a high voltage on it, and have it spray like electrospray would, but it's paper spray, acquire the data and report the results. And their projection is from zero seconds to prick the finger to 60 seconds, you would get the report out. So um, that will, um, if we can really achieve that, that has the potential for point of care. Um, we'll see if we really ever get mass spectrometers in the, in the home or the doctor's office, but at least it's certainly an area that's, that's worth um, thinking a lot about, I think. Um, and then finally, the automated clinical analyzer. That happens to be a thermo-automated clinical analyzer. I don't know how any of you have those in your lab, but I picked a thermo one because I think that if we ever get there with mass spectrometry, and obviously all the instrument companies are going to do it, I think that what we'll end up inside will be something that looks like that. Because um, it turns out, if you were at MSACL this week, talking to the, the clinical um, folks doing mass spectrometry, most folks doing mass spectrometry do this on triple quads today, and that's because they want to do quantitation. And um, the triple quad does that quantitation experiment you know, better than, than most other platforms. But there's lots of other things you could do with other kinds of mass spectrometric platforms. I think that's what we will see um, if we see some of these automated clinical analyzers coming out that have a box on top so you can't tell there's a mass spectrometer inside. That's where we will probably will be. So a quick summary. Um, that second S, the selectivity of MSMS is its primary advantage for clinical analysis. Don't forget that one. Um, speed. The third S is critical to acceptance, uh, partially because it affects the fourth S, that dollar sign of how much it costs to do the analysis. I think there's many successes already. Um, you go to some place like Europe and you have, you know, 
75 or 90 triple quads, you know, in the clinical lab. It's a pretty remarkable number in one spot. Um, the future is bright, I think. Imaging mass spec, I think, has an awful lot of potential to, to um, have an impact in, in clinical, particularly anatomical pathology. Um, direct analysis with no separation at all would certainly speed things up. Um, point of care mass spectrometry, that should be, should be our goal, is to make our little mass spectrometers the same size as that cell phone and, uh, and really make them inexpensive, fast, sensitive, and selective. Um, big challenge there. Um, and then automated mass spec clinical analyzers and, you know, the FDA notwithstanding, I, th I think we're going to see, you know, uh, significant um, successes there and obviously big success already in the, in the bacterial identification side. So let me thank you for your attention, and I left a minute, apparently, <laughs> for questions. Thank you. Okay, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, So it's a big question, big question clinically about the relevance of epimers and, and, and so on of, of vitamin D. Um, a number of papers have been published talking about that. Um, I think that um, it's a good question in this, in this. I mean, as an analytical chemist, I want to know them all, um, obviously, but for the clinical folks, which ones are clinically relevant? So I think, um, you know, we now have more information by mass spec than we have by amino assays. Um, question is now, how useful is that added information to a clinician? And I don't think the answer is in place yet for that question. And there's a number of these assays. Once you give them more information, you have to decide what that is. And, and Alan would point out that, that the problem currently is we, these, we tend to give these clinicians too much information. They want to know name of analyte and a value in the reference range, right? And the fact that you want to explain that there's three isomers and all this other stuff and it has different isoforms and so on is some, not something that the typical clinician wants to know when they're treating a patient. So I think there's an uh, issue there between information that we have and what they need. But it's a good question. Okay, so, I'm, I'm, so uh, <laughs> quite long enough question. I missed, I missed the, the area you're talking about is specifically what? Dry blood spots. Dry blood spots, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the folks in my own lab we've dealt with for dry blood spot analysis are mostly pharma companies doing clinical trials where they used to ship, you know, ice chests full of, of vials of blood from wherever the clinical trials were back to the lab, and that's expensive, and it's, you know, um, bloodborne pathogen issues and so on, and if you can put them on a piece of paper, it's no longer considered bloodborne pathogen. You don't have to refrigerate them. You can put a heck of a lot more of them in a box. <clears throat> um, so that certainly generated an awful lot of interest there. There's a lot of challenges because of the concentration, the sample size is small. There's potential issues for changes during that time. Um, certainly for the clinical side, you know, we've been doing dry blood spot analysis for a long time for inborn errors of metabolism. Um, that's been the accepted methodology there. Um, this particular point of care one, we can argue whether it's, it's dry blood spot or not because they prick the finger, put it on the paper, filter paper and spray right away, adding a little solvent, so it never really has time to dry. Um, I know, I think personally the verdict's out. We're doing dry blood spot work in my lab, not in that specific area. And um, we find that reproducibility and so on is a challenge. Um, but um, I think there's some, you know, I think there's some potential promise there. One can argue in that kind of a setting, maybe, you know, if you, what you're asking from that dried blood spot's not a lot, you know, and, and the levels aren't too low, this may be a very attractive way as opposed to taking it, adding, you know, 10 microliters of solvent, shaking it, pulling up, you know, some of the liquid and then squirting into the mass spectrometer, you know, paper spray leaves a bunch of the crap behind on the paper, hopefully. So I, I don't think the, the verdict's in yet. Um, but there's a lot of people who are very interested in it, so I, I think an area that's worth spending time, that's why we're worrying about it for the pharmaceutical side, at least. Yeah. 